A tēnā koutou katoa e te whānau whānui, nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa e tēnē wā o te tau. Good evening, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Annika, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for coming along this evening. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to give this public talk. Um, part of the, the 50th celebrations, um, and I get to talk about a couple of things that I'm particularly interested in. So I'm going to talk about human-centred computing and the aim of the talk is to sort of start in um, some of my early research in this area and talk a little bit about some of those projects and then we're going to move through time. So we're going to travel through time from about 2010 onwards and make our way towards the Internet of Things and some more recent projects I'm working on and through all of that we're going to think about what it means to be a human who interacts with technology and how that technology has changed and what that means for the people who are doing the computing. So those of you who were here last month, um, we had uh, Jacob Herakusen from Maths gave his talk and he had some really nice pictures, 50 year old technology to go with the theme of 50 years of computing. So I decided to shamelessly borrow that idea. So thank you, Jacob, for that um, and start with some pictures. So. Um, here are some pictures of computers that are interesting for a number of different reasons. So the one in the top left is interesting because it's from 1973. So it's exactly 50 years old, along with computing at Waikato. It's interesting for a couple of other reasons, because if you think about some of the pictures you might have seen of kind of old computing, you might have seen those pictures of kind of big rooms full of towers and big you know, reels of tape on them, or those huge machines kind of as big as this desk with punch card trays and things you put in. But here, clearly, 50 years ago, we're already into the era of the desktop computer, a machine that's got everything you need to do your work in one place. So the Wang has, the, has a keyboard. It's got a numeric keyboard. It's got a tiny little screen on it. So the human can type something in, the human being the user, the person who wants to fulfill some task, and they can get some feedback from the, the little screen. Nothing graphical, nothing like you'd see um, on a modern desktop machine, but the inputs and outputs are already looking familiar to us. And then the little kind of gray rectangle next to the screen there is um, for a cassette, and that's the way that data was stored. So 1973 was a bit early for me to actually be doing anything with computers. So if we slide across to the, the BBC Micro, 1982, that's the first computer I ever had my hands on. So that's a computer that we had um, at high school. And the BBC Micro was part of a government push during that time to get people in school programming. So they were sort of these, these machines were made and they were distributed around schools. And the idea was to kind of get kids interested in technology and programming. What was interesting about it from my perspective was we had computer club at lunchtime once a week and you could go and play on the computers. And we discovered very quickly that you could program them to do space invaders. So what it meant was you could have an hour's lunch basically playing space invaders for free, which in 1982 was quite a big deal because otherwise you had to go to an arcade and put money in a machine. So this was really cool that we could write our own Space Invaders. And also you could tweak it so that you won a lot more. You could kind of make it easier. So it was kind of a win-win situation. So then at the bottom, um, in 1990, that's um, a picture of the first computer that I owned, which was a Commodore C64. I bought it secondhand. Um, it doesn't come with a monitor. I had a little portable black and white television and I used to plug it into that. And the reason I bought it was because it came with lots of cassettes. So again, you see the little cassette player there with standard audio cassettes, which is probably a bit retro, even for some people in the room now. They were things that you used to play music on, so for the people at the back. Um, so that was how you kind of loaded your program. You'd literally load it off the cassette tape and then write some code and store it back onto the cassette tape. And it came with a whole series of games on cassette. So there's a bit of a theme developing here. So I bought it to play games and then I found that you could go to the library and you could get a book which had all of the code for other games and you could write your own games. So that was also kind of a, a, a sort of a, a gateway into doing a bit of programming um, back in the 1990s. So the, all of these have got some similarities in that they assume that 
a user is going to put their input into the computer using a keyboard. So we don't have any mice here yet, um, that's, that's later. But we have input and we have output. And those two things are kind of the standard building blocks of how humans or people or us use computers. We use them because we've got some task we want to fulfill. And so we tell the computer in some way what we want it to do. And then when it's finished, it tells us and we get some output. So that's sort of one of the, the fundamental um, components of what we mean when we talk about human-centered computing is thinking about the person before we think about the machine. So here you can see a whole variety of different kinds of technology. So now we've still got the, the screens and the keyboards. Now we've got a mouse as well. There's also a touch screen device in there and a tablet. Again, the intention of all of them is still to get information or input from the user so that they can control what the machine does. So that the human in this case is acting upon the computer. The human is the actor and the computer does what it's told, perhaps. So this is probably a good time to do a bit of audience participation and ask some questions. So hands up anybody who's ever been using a computer and some software and it has kind of stopped working or just failed to do what you wanted to do, or you just couldn't get it to, to give you the output you wanted. Right. Um, so similarly, hands up anybody who's ever downloaded an app for their mobile phone because they had a specific task they wanted and very quickly they realized that you couldn't use it to do what you wanted to or it didn't work and you never went back to it ever again and you probably deleted it and then it kind of disappeared. And, uh, and a final show of hands for anybody who, when this happens, has this kind of niggling feeling in the back of their mind that maybe it's your fault because you don't actually quite know what you're doing with the technology. <laughs> they're, they're very confident people here. Yeah. And I'm not putting my hand up because the joy of working in human-centered computing is when that happens, you can quite confidently say, well, it's been very badly designed. Something wrong with it. Clearly not my fault. So human-centered computing is sort of an umbrella term. It covers a whole range of um, different aspects or disciplines within computer science. And one of the central ones is HCI or human-computer interaction which is all about how people interact with computers. So in the simplest form is how do we give it instructions? How do we tell it what to do? But at the heart of that is making sure that the things we design can be used by their users. They actually do the task that the user wants and they actually support the user in effectively getting what they want from it. So when that goes wrong, you end up with some software that doesn't work or an app that you can't use or um, basically the feeling that somehow you're running into problems because you can't use the computer. But typically it's because actually it's not been very well designed. So HCI kind of thinks of the human as somebody who has abilities in terms of what can we see and what can we hear and what, to, what can we remember. And it enables us to design software that kind of utilizes what we know. So if you've got a piece of software that asks you to memorize a 20 digit number and then four screens later, you have to repeat that number back it's pretty much guaranteed to fail because our human memory doesn't work like that. So it's all about taking advantage of what we know about people, has lots of its roots in psychology, and enables us to really think about the human user and design for the human user. So human-centered computing incorporates HCI, but is also kind of wider than that. It's kind of much more holistic in that we think, Whatever we're doing in terms of software development or design, we should keep the user at the forefront of our thoughts and at the forefront of our design processes, which means including them as much as possible within that design process so that we know that we're building things that are going to be useful to them for a start. We're not just kind of creating software and apps that no one is ever going to use, but we have a specific user or a group of users and some tasks that they want to achieve in mind before we kind of go ahead and build something. So the work that, that I've been doing in this area started back in, I don't know, um, about 2008. Um, and my approach sort of came from not the human computer interaction side, but from software engineering, formal methods, modeling software, um, work I was doing with uh, with Steve Reeves, sort of the back there. Um, and 
So the, the point of kind of creating models of software is to make sure it works before you build it. That's the point. You build a model, you test the model, and it gives you some confidence that the software that you're going to develop is going to do the right thing. And my interest in that was, well, how can we take those, those kind of methods, these ways of modeling software, and actually incorporate human-centered aspects into that so that we treat those concerns with the same level of rigor as we do the underlying software? So when I started in that area, the first sort of things I was looking at um, were medical devices, so things that look like this. Um, on the left is a, a volumetric uh, infusion device, and on the right, a syringe driver. And both of these are uh, really standard medical devices in hospitals and clinics and medical settings all over the world. And they're just designed to make it easier for medical personnel to deliver medication um, to their patients. So in the simplest form, what each of these devices should do is allow a user to enter some information, like how much medicine should I deliver? How long should I take to deliver it? And then it will calculate the rate and it controls the flow of medication. So you can guarantee that the patient is getting the correct dosage. And the, the Alaris pump on the left also has some sensors in it. So it can identify if there's any air in the pipe and it can generate an alarm because clearly that's not something that you want to happen. So fundamentally, they're, they're quite simple devices. And the reason we started looking at them and were very interested in them is because despite their simplicity, they, um, they're kind of at the heart of errors that happen all over the world all of the time on a very regular basis. Things go wrong with the use of these devices very often. And about 95%, at least, of those errors are not because there's something wrong with the software or the machine has failed or broken. They're attributed to user error. The person using the device has done something wrong. And that's really interesting because if you think of who are the people using these devices, they're highly trained medical personnel. They're people who are trained to deliver medicine to people and who care about it and are trying to do it right. So even though they might be in kind of challenging environments, a very busy A&E department or even a rescue helicopter, there can be a lot going on. But the people themselves have been trained to use them and they have years of training in medicine. So this raised a really interesting question. It's like, well, why is it so hard for them to use these devices and why do they get it wrong so often? Um, and when you start kind of looking at these in a different way by kind of creating models of how they behave, you start uncovering some really interesting properties. So if you look at the, um, the syringe driver, you can see it's got eight buttons and one screen. So if you discount the on-off button, I think, well, that probably just turns the device on and off. There are seven buttons. I can probably remember what seven buttons do. And I've got a screen that's telling me what's happening. So I should be okay. But if you ask the question, what does that first button, the gray button with the up triangle do? The answer is, it depends because these are modal devices, which means they have different modes of operation. And you can see on the Alaris here, it says it's got the word infusing on it. And that means it's in the infusing mode. So they have several different modes. They have a startup mode. They have a, a mode for when you're entering volume of medication. They have a mode for when you're entering the time of the medication. They've got a mode for when you're checking the rate. They've got a mode when you're checking that the right syringe is in. And in each of those modes, each of those buttons might behave differently might and some they might behave the same as some they don't so if you kind of create the model as we did of all of the different modes of this device what you end up with is not seven buttons that you have to worry about you have to worry about seven buttons in about 15 states and if you then take that model and you show it to somebody who really knows about these devices like we did the guy we were working with at um, Waikato District Hospital and we said do you know that this is how the device works he had no idea because the user has a mental model, which is I turn it on, I check this thing, I enter these values, I press this button, I check this, I press this button and it starts. And that's fine if you don't get interrupted. You don't accidentally press one of the other buttons when you're doing it. They're quite small buttons. Imagine operating that in an ambulance or in a rescue helicopter or something like that. Pretty easy to just kind of accidentally hit the on off button. 
I could probably talk for about an hour about what happens if you do accidentally hit the on-off button. It's definitely not what you would expect. And it has a partial memory whereby if you're partway through setting it up and something happens, it might remember the values you've entered so far or it might not, depending on where you are in that cycle. And it took us a long time to actually find out what was happening with that. So suddenly the question of why are they so hard to use becomes much more obvious because the mental model that we have of how to use it bears very little relation to the actual model of the system and how it works. So this is a really good example of something that's been designed to do a job, a very important job, but at some point somebody's forgotten that the people using this have another job that they're trying to do and that's deliver medication to a patient in a complex setting and that they don't have time to get the manual down and read it and look something up. And in fact, even if they did, we also created a model of the manual, and um, they're actually inconsistent anyway, so it probably wouldn't help you. So these kinds of things are fascinating and they're a really good reminder that when we say 95% of the errors in use of this device are human user errors, what we actually mean is that 95% of the errors are caused by the design and the structure and how these are built and the fact that we haven't actually remembered how people are going to use them. So we spent quite a few years um, working with these devices. And then in 2014, I ended up somewhere very different. So in 2014, I started doing some work with Annika Hinza, who's here today, um, and subsequently also with Gemma, who's here today. Um, and we started doing some work in forestry. And if you can imagine what it's like to be a female university academic walking into a forestry site, that's kind of the expression on the faces of the people when you meet them, particularly when you turn up in the university's little electric vehicle. So they're a little kind of bemused by, by why we were there and what we were doing. So a good question to ask, why were we there and what were we doing? So if you remember 2014, from a technology point of view, there was an absolute explosion of the Fitbit style wearable devices. They were absolutely everywhere. So kind of the, the years preceding that there'd been Fitbit and there'd been Jawbone and a few others, and they just absolutely exploded. And you couldn't move without some kind of wearable tracker that counted your steps and measured your heart rate and did all sorts of different things. And so because it's new technology, we were kind of interested in it and interested in um, what kinds of domains we might use it in. And at the same time, through conversations that Annika had been having with uh, various people and some conversations that I'd been having and thinking about, we were sort of presented with this idea of, well, if you want to kind of work in an area that's interesting and really valuable and has the potential to do something good, look at forestry. Because as many of you probably know, the accident and fatality rate in New Zealand forestry is very high, much higher than in other countries who have very big forestry domains. And that's partly because of our terrain. So if you go to Canada, for example, where they do way more forestry, it's very flat. So they use a lot of machinery. Whereas, of course, in New Zealand, we plant forests on the sides of mountains. And so we have lots more what they call boots on the ground, lots more manual workers. So already you've got more people around. So you think potentially that could be one, um, one potential cause of the problem. And then as you start talking to the various people, the workers and the contractors and the forestry owners and the forestry contracting companies and the companies who invest in the forestry land, it's a very complex uh, setup. You ask people, well, what's, you know, why, is, why is there such a, a high accident rate? And you sort of hear different, um, different themes. And one that comes up a lot is this notion of fatigue and tiredness and workers being too tired to properly concentrate or tired so that their reaction times are slower. And these are the kinds of things that lead to accidents. The other, I'll call it a myth because it's never been proved, certainly not by us. The other myth that we heard a lot was that Working in forestry as a manual forestry worker is the equivalent workload of running a marathon every day. So that's kind of an interesting statistic. Firstly, it's an um, uh, interesting fact. Firstly, it's like, well, if I got everyone now to go outside, next bit of audience participation, go outside and we're going to run a marathon, 
it might be quite hard and we may not all make it. We may not all make it back. But if we did that regularly and we did it every day, over time, our bodies would adjust to it. So if it is the case that working in forestry is equivalent to running a marathon every day, what does that even mean? After a month, does it not matter? You're kind of used to it and your body's adjusted to it. Is it worse for the new workers than it is for the older workers? Is there a point where you get super fit and it's fine and then you decline again? So really sort of interesting things to think about there. And also this nagging thing of, well, how do we know whether it's the equivalent of running a marathon every day? Ah, we've got wearable trackers, hundreds and hundreds of wearable trackers. Great idea. Why don't we do some data gathering, a really big data collection exercise. We'll get 100 forestry workers. We'll get them all to wear a wrist tracker. And for a period of two or three weeks, maybe even a month, we'll collect data. And then we will be the people who have the first set of data that can tell us something about the workloads and the walking and the hills and the heart rates, all of these forestry workers. So that was 2014, where are we now? 2023, nine years later, never happened. We never ever, despite kind of seven years working on this, got to the point where we could do that. And the minute we started to do it, lots of things became very apparent. So our first study was with four forestry workers for one week. Let's start small, do a little pilot, that'll work, and then we'll go back with our 100 and get them all out. Um, so we turned up in our little university electric vehicle and spoke to the contractor who was really keen about this work because he said, look, you know, I, I want my guys to be safe and I know they work really hard. It'd be really interesting to get some data. And then the four guys, he tapped on the shoulder. He said, these, these guys are all really keen to do your study. Um, and because we know about HCI and about running studies with users, we talked to them and we explained to them what we were doing and we got consent from them to collect their data. Uh, we were collecting... At that point, I think, step counts and sleep tracking, because most of these devices, you could track people's sleep as well. So we gave them the instructions and little bits of paper with the information on how to charge the devices and how to set everything up. And we went away and said, see you in a week. Came back a week later. So first guy, oh, I've lost mine. Caught it on a bush on the first day. Ping, gone. Never seen again. Second guy, couldn't charge it. The dog ate the charger. Couldn't charge mine. Third one, oh, I couldn't, I can never work out because you had to kind of put them into sleep mode and active mode. Never quite work out how to do that. Don't, no data. Fourth guy, yeah, I think, I think I've got it working. Download the data half a day. Okay. Didn't think they were that hard. Try again. By the end of the four week period, we really had almost nothing. And lots of reasons for that. Partly the technology, to be fair that, you know, with the best will in the world, these things were not designed to be worn in outdoor rugged environments by forestry workers. So we can't totally say, well, they're terrible because they don't work in the forest. That's not what they were designed for. We can say that they're terrible because they didn't work mostly at all. Um, because at one point we had a student wearing seven <laughs> as part of a honours project. It's a great honours project. You can just make students do things for long periods of time. So he was wearing all of these devices and we thought, well, they're probably not going to count exactly the same, but if you imagine the pattern of somebody walking, all of the graphs should be kind of similar at least. Absolutely not. No correlation between them at all. Not even close. So we weren't even convinced that in a controlled environment we could get good data off them. Never mind going to a, a rugged outdoor environment with a group of guys who with the best will in the world were very, very suspicious of what we were doing, and quite rightly. So now, of course, it's quite common. We all wear kind of Apple watches or lots of us do or carry mobile phones. We know we're being tracked and we know that the data is going somewhere and we kind of put it out of our mind as much as we can. But in 2014, when you say to a forestry worker, we're going to track your energy levels and we're going to see you know, how fit you are for work. And then we're going to track your sleep and see if in the morning you're fit for work as well. Understandably, they start thinking, well, what happens if I'm not? What happens if I come in on day two and my boss looks at this data and says, oh, I don't think you're fit for work. Can you go home? I'm not paying you for the day either. Off you go. So understandably, there was concern about the data and what we were going to do with the data and what these devices were even tracking, particularly when you're saying, when you go to bed, press this button and it'll track all of your movement to measure your sleep. 
we had some interesting conversations around explaining that one. So we sort of, although we were thinking, well, we understand that we're doing experiments on humans, of course, we'll explain it to them. We hadn't really taken on board the people that we were dealing with. They weren't just humans. They were forestry workers and they had a job and they were paid on a very tight time frame to do some work. And our study really didn't take that on board properly. So the rest of sort of the next seven years while we were working on this project, and this included um, an MB funded component of the project, our focus was very different. Our focus shifted to, is there technology firstly that works in that environment? Can we collect any meaningful data? Can we measure things? What can we measure and what does it mean? And can we do it in a way that actually suits the needs of the workers, not the needs of our research project? That actually they're comfortable enough with because it's giving them back something. It's telling them something that they wouldn't otherwise know. And that meant we'd have to fly up to Northland and meet with groups of forestry workers and Farno crew who were fabulous and spent lots of time with us. And particularly the families, they were really keen on knowing that their family was safe. For them, that was an absolute crucial thing. That's why they wanted to talk to us. So one of the workers, his wife said, every time I hear a helicopter, I have to rush outside and check it's not the Westpac rescue helicopter. Because at any moment, it could be an accident that's happened to someone in my family. And so our focus was really then on, OK, what is the technology that would work for these people that they would actually embrace? Let them drive it, not us. And so our focus shifted because we remembered that the people were more important than an experiment with wearable trackers. And that our idea of 100 people gathering data for four weeks was, in hindsight, perhaps a little naive. So that sort of takes us through time now to sort of more recent times. We're still doing some work around the um, kind of me measuring biometrics and understanding what that means, particularly Gemma is still working on that, looking at what can you tell from things like um, skin impedance, galvanic skin response and heart rate. What does that tell you about people and the, how well they're feeling and um, thinking about things like cognitive fatigue, not just physical fatigue? Because lots of forestry workers working great big machines lifting logs and they're doing that all day. And if they get tired, that's potentially way more dangerous to the people around them. They may be fine, but the people around them may not be. So still doing some of that work, and I was getting more and more interested at that point about this nature of wearable technology. Because remember I said that we had these input devices like keyboards and mice because we, the human, were giving instructions to the computer. And when you put a wearable device on and your data that's being gathered is the import, the dynamic is shifting slightly. It's not an explicit instruction. I'm not saying press this button because I want the computer to do something, but the measurements coming from my body are driving an algorithm, which is measuring and deciding something about the data and then doing something in response. So this notion of sort of implicit interaction and what that means in terms of wearable devices and IoT, the Internet of Things, which just means everyday items connected to the Internet and talking, that becomes a really interesting human-centered problem because we're sort of shifting away from the human and we're thinking about the technology. And potentially, you can get very easily drawn into the joy of that technology because there's some really cool stuff. It's really interesting, right? You get your hands on it, you go, oh, this is cool. And you start doing some things and then you go, oh, this is cool. So if I was to go up now to my office, very dark, walk into my office, I would walk in the door and the lights would come on. And I don't need to turn the light switch on because there's a sensor in the room and it can tell that I've walked in the room. So it's sort of taking this implicit behavior. I'm doing something quite different. I'm just walking into a room, but the light is coming on because it knows it's dark and it knows that there's a person in the room. And so these kinds of things, you think, well, that's nice. That's a nice thing that we can have now, this kind of technology. If I've got my hands full, I don't have to worry about the light switch. And then I sit down at my desk, and this is the point where everybody who works at the University of Waikato will recognize this. 
you sit down and you start doing something and you're really concentrating. So you're not moving very much. And then the lights all go out because the motion sensor thinks you're not there anymore because you're not doing anything. So then you have to jump up and you don't know where the sensor is. So you're kind of doing this around the office that I'm still here dance. So it's kind of a, a regular occurrence if you're you know, here after dark in the building. And it's because the sensor is just based on motion. So you think, well, we could do better than that. Why don't we kind of enhance it? We could have um, a heat detector in the room as well that could determine my body heat and it knows I'm still there. That would be better. Or I could put in a sensor in the door so it knows I've walked in and it knows I haven't walked out. So we could kind of start adding technology. It's quite addictive. You think, well, I could add this thing and I could add that and that would be really cool. And I end up with this office that not only does the light come on when I walk in, but when I sit down at my desk, the light on that side of the room dims a little bit. And the lights around my desk come up a little bit because I'm working there. And that'd be quite nice. We don't have that. If we did, it would be really cool. So that's kind of taking us to this um, envisaged future. A thing that we're sort of almost at, and we talk about it a lot, this notion of the smart home, where there's all of these devices and all of this technology, and it's all there to make our lives easier by... Firstly, knowing our patterns of behavior. And secondly, being able to gather information about us and respond accordingly. So if I come home from work every day, say I come in at five o'clock and every day I come in and I sit down, the first thing I do is say, oh, I'd love a cup of tea. I get up and make a cup of tea. Well, not anymore. Now in my envisaged future, I walk in the door, I sit down and my home robot has turned the kettle on because it knows when I open the garage door. So the kettle's on. And out it wheels with my cup of tea and it gives me a cup of tea. And it does that for me every day. And that's very nice. A nice way to run my dad. I have to make the cup of tea myself. It's all there for me. And then again, you start thinking, well, that's okay. But some days are better than other days. Some days when I get home, I don't want a cup of tea. Some days when I get home, I'd actually quite like a glass of wine or a gin and tonic or two gins and tonic, depending on what kind of day I've had. And of course, if my robot brings me a cup of tea, I might be a bit disappointed by that. What I'd like is it to behave a bit more like, I don't know, my, my non-robotic human life partner who would say, have you had a nice day? And I go, no, I've had a terrible day. And they turn the kettle off and out comes a glass of wine instead. Okay, so we can do that. Let's start building some more sensors into the house. Maybe the home sensors are going to get the data from my wearable sensors and my wearable sensors are giving away information about my mood. So now when I get home and I walk in, immediately the, the smart home knows that I've had a terrible day. Doesn't even think about putting the kettle on. Out comes the trolley, bottle of wine, glass, thank you very much. Again, we can start adding more and more things in. This is quite appealing. It seems quite nice. The woman in the picture here looks very happy in this envisaged future with uh, a robot coming and um, presenting some video call with her family to, to make her life more interesting. And um, we might sort of think, well, I talk about it as an envisaged future because we know we're not quite there yet. So we have a robotic vacuum cleaner at home. It's kind of, you know, very nice. It knows the map of the house and it can do things. And I spend a lot of time shouting at it, to be fair. I have once chased it down the garden because I'd left the sliding doors open. It was making a run for it. But it doesn't always quite work as, as well as you might hope it to. So we need more things, right? We need more sensors. We need, we need better ways of understanding. We need more wearable technology. And that way, we can put the human right in the system. I'm not a user anymore. I'm not a person who's pressing a button and telling the computer what to do. I'm in the loop. I'm part of the system. Everything I do and all of my behavior is now part of the smart home. We're kind of integrated. We're becoming one. So how do we actually make that happen then? What do we need? Well, we're going to need cameras in every room of the house. Every single room and every single corner of every room in the house. The living room, your kitchen, your bedroom, your bathroom. There's no way you can go in the house or your garden that you're not being watched by these cameras. We'll put some microphones in for good measure as well, so that if I say something, oh, I've had a terrible day, out comes the robot with a bottle of wine. In my bed, there are sensors that are determining how I sleep. In my chairs, there are sensors that make sure I'm sitting properly. 
all of my biometric measurements are being captured and analyzed. And everything I do is being watched and observed and the data is being crunched and the algorithm is making decisions. And now it's the computer who's in charge. It's not me. The computer is making the decisions. And the computer is acting upon me, the human, not me, the human, acting upon the computer. Until one day you get up and you wake up, you say, oh, I think I'll go out for a walk. And you go to your front door and you can't open the front door. Think, well, that's weird. And you can't open the front door because when you got up, your, your home sensing system detected that your temperature was maybe half a degree higher than it had been the night before. And in 10 minutes time, it's going to be a bit drizzly outside and you might catch a cold. So why don't you just stay in? And now we're firmly in the loop. Now we're at the point where it's the computer that's in charge and not the user. The human center now means something quite different. We're at the center of the technology, but we're no longer in control of it. So, Blakey's attempt to lift the moon. Cute dog pictures, that will work. Maybe I didn't pick these pictures. In all of the seats you're sitting in, imagine there are sensors and they're capturing data about you and have been since you arrived here. And when I was talking through that kind of dystopian nightmare of being under cameras and microphones and everybody's mood was coming down and we were all starting to go, well, I thought this was going to be fun or we should stay down and watch Corrie. But instead, the sensors are going, mm, I think we need to lighten the mood a bit. What can we do to lighten the mood? I know, random picture of cute dogs. And, you know, let's be clear about this, they are very cute dogs. So, of course, they're going to lift the mood and make people feel better. So, we can use these inferences to drive the outputs that we give to you. We can say, well, what does it mean to say the people in the back row are really grumpy and the people in the front row are moderately grumpy? Well, show them one picture and we'll show the people over here a picture and we'll see from the centers in the seats whose mood lifts the best. Is this the right picture? And again, we can start learning in it. So we can do things perhaps that are a little more playful. It doesn't have to be just this dystopian idea of the door that won't let you out or the robot that sends you to bed because it thinks you need an early night because you're getting up early in the morning. What about we think about different ways of using the data and saying, well, let's imagine rather than collecting all of this data, so when I leave here today and I download the, the seat data, I go, well, people in row one, they really enjoyed it. People in the back right corner, not so much. Rather than individually pinpointing each of you and going, well, I must remember tomorrow to be nice to this person because they had a bad night. We can gather all of that data together and maybe do something more playful with it. So say, well, what if we could capture all of this mood data and just, I don't know, have some big display somewhere. And rather than it being this kind of one-to-one -one mapping of, well, you look at this big screen and you go, oh, that pixel there, I think that's Judy in her office. She looks cross. It's much more playful from that. So we're doing some, some work in the area at the moment just to think about what it means to gather all of that data together and smoosh it up and then just throw it back out to the universe in some kind of visualization. What impact does that have on people? Do they notice? Do they care? And more interestingly, because we don't want to dig down into people's individual data, we don't want to, to know that the person in row four, seat three, had a kind of minor spike of excitement at slide three and then dozed off for the rest of my talk. But they might want to know that. So once we've gathered all of this data and mushed it all together, how do we unpack it all again? Or how does the individual person unpack it again? And can you see where your data has gone? Can I look at it and go, well, if I see I'm here and I'm, somehow I've popped up over here, how did my data get there? What route did it take? So you'll sometimes hear people talk about things like provenance, like what, what's happened to this artifact and who has done it? Imagine if you could do that with your data so that when you go home tonight and you log on to Facebook and it's weirdly showing you an ad to something that you mentioned in passing over the tea break to your friend, you can then look behind that and go, well, how did... How did that bit of information get there? Where has my data traveled in order to get there? And how do I tag it somehow so that I know it's me? How can I see it passing through the system? And in that way, perhaps we can pull back a little bit and go, it's not that we shouldn't be doing interesting things with technology, 
But rather than letting the technology drive what it is we do, why don't we let the people drive what it is we do? Just think about who is in control of this and put the, the user firmly back in the center. So when we look at a picture like this, so in the middle, we've got IoT, the Internet of Things, we should kind of cut that little picture out and put the human user right in the center and think about what it means to, to understand not just what they want to do, but what the impact is of all of this technology interacting upon the user. So there's, there's a thing you, again, you may have, some of you in computing will have heard about this and some others of you may have as well, the thing called the digital twin, where you have some, some system, some machine, and you create a model of it, a kind of replica, and you feed the replica the data from the real running system and it allows you to reason about the system and to see if it's doing the right thing or if it's going to go wrong at some point. So imagine if we could do that with the human user. So well, what about we create the digital twin of the user and as we're collecting this data, rather than just using it to determine, should I open the door, should I send them to bed early, whatever it is, we actually use that to understand what the impact is of living in these environments. What does it mean to be in the middle of all of this? What does it mean to be the human in the loop and have all this IT around us? Does it actually make me feel better? Or does it over time start kind of chipping away and degrading my quality of life and actually making me feel quite miserable? So we've got the opportunity to do either of these things. We can remember that if the person's at the center, everything flows outwards rather than where we're going at the moment, where we're sort of turning inwards a little bit. And the human just becomes just another part of the machine rather than being able to step out and go, what is it I actually want to do? What is it that I want to share? How much do I want my home to impinge on me as an autonomous human being? Maybe I'd quite like to be in control of my own life for a bit and not be dictated to by my curtains closing randomly because it's getting dark outside. So we've sort of gone round in a big circle. We started off with this notion of the desktop computer and the human finally being able to go, I can control this with a keyboard and I can play games when I want to and I can do all of these cool things. And we've shifted, we've just kind of started drifting away because as the technology has gotten more and more interesting and more and more smart, smart, the way we think about it and what it does, it's very seductive makes us forget about the people at the other end of it. And maybe what we should be doing is just taking a step back and putting the person back in the center, just reminding ourselves. So I started the lecture by borrowing Jacob's idea of 60 year old computing. So I'll end by borrowing from the university's motto. So what is the most important thing in technology design? It's the people. If we're not designing something that is helping someone, that is doing a task that they want to and that they're in control of, then why are we bothering? So in exactly 50 minutes, I will stop. Thank you. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, so I will throw open the floor. Oh, I've had a question slide. Yeah. I'll throw open the floor to anybody who has questions. Yeah. So I'm imagining a near future of metaverse and secure on purpose because it's really used to get and it's mainly system. Yeah. Uh, and of course in the metaverse, it's been very easy to train. So, uh, yeah. So what is the main kind of threat to new users that advantage? Well, I think it has both of those things in, in, in large measures. So I think we've already seen some of the kind of great possibilities and opportunities from um, that kind of immersive environment and immersive technology and even things like, you know, the, the hot topic of the day, the AI, um, large learning models that you know, generate text. And, you know, people can use them for really amazing things. And so the, there's huge opportunity. The downside, of course, is that once all of the data is there and all of the people are there and all of these things are being shared, you sort of start just losing control of 
which parts of it belong to you and what's being done with it and how it might be being used in ways that you definitely didn't intend it to. It may not be harmful to you, but maybe it's harmful to other people. Uh, so I think it's not that I think any of these things are in and of themselves terrible. It's more that we need to understand that there is a balance of the great things that we can do and also the things that are perhaps less desirable. And we should ask people before we kind of go ahead and create them and throw people into them. We should actually understand what it means to be in that environment. Because for most of us, we don't know. I mean, you know, going back to 1980 when I was playing Space Invaders, I had no clue that one day I would walk around with a computer the size of my thumb, which is way more powerful than any computer I had my hands on at that point, and it could do all of these amazing things. And it could also track everywhere I went and send my data off to somebody, and I have no clue where it's going, really. Yes. Hi, did I not the tour? Thank you. Do I like the first of beauty in the big way of Toto? I started just to follow you all career. Um, so I'm just curious, can you imagine? Well, I'm just wondering how the so was study the image of study with Pat Al. Mm. I mean, you ready in the user of which you wish. Uh, and I were at the letter machine, like physician stuff where the treaty really needs the electronic line. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely not the gin and tonic one, then. I, I'd like to be in control of that. But I think, you know, there are, um, sort of all jokes aside, when people envisage these kind of smart environments, and particularly supportive smart environments, the intention behind them is really good. So you say, well, in 20 years' time, I may be a little less agile and sprightly than I am now. It might be really helpful for me to have technology that allows me to just stay living in my own home. And I don't need to move into a, a care home or a hospital or a rest environment because actually everything I need is in the house. So again, we have opportunities for that to be really uh, a positive thing, but only if we understand what that means to be living in that environment. And at the moment, I think we talk about, you know, user experience and understanding how users feel about things. I don't think we're close enough to really understanding what the impact of those kind of environments are and how that impacts you. And actually, maybe I would be better off with the real humans around me rather than the technology. That's the new thing. How would it work? Um, you have all the sins about you, um, but you would actually have to teach the system what? Hmm. Uh, imagine a scenario, usually you go home and get your gin and drink it, but then at some point, Kalindo could go friend is in the same movie. Yeah. And you have never told that guy um, that you actually drink gin and hmm. never attended. <laughs> and I've been outed by my home house. <laughs> I forgot to teach at sister. And yeah. I mean, you, you, you say, well, who designed this system? They had no idea. They know nothing about me, clearly. Who would have thought that I would want to do? So when you spent a, a year on teaching that system, all the different scenarios? Sure, if you've got the patience and the will to do that. I mean, um, I say I can't even control my home robot vacuum cleaner, so goodness knows how I'd manage for the whole house. But seriously, there is actually a lot of work done on even when you think of the sort of smart technology that's becoming quite common, like the... Um, Kind of the lights and the curtains and the heat and the home entertainment system. So these are, you know, things that people have in their home. And there's a huge amount of work being done in the HCI community about creating ways for people to do exactly that, to kind of set them up and control them, because they're really complex. You know, sometimes I can't even set my sky to record something, and that's like four screens and two buttons. So when you've got all of these interacting things and you've got to think about all of the scenarios, um, and there's always going to be a scenario that I haven't thought of, you know, the, the the mystery person who turns up or whatever it is. So there's something, again, it's very appealing to think, well, I'll just let the system observe and learn. Because if I have to go to all the bother of trying to teach it to do something, we could be here a long time. And I'll probably give up halfway through it, the same way I do with an app that I can't work properly. Um. Yes, yeah, please. Oh, I, 
<laughs> you should be worried about the medical devices. Yeah, um, so not not with us, but there's a lot of people around the world doing this kind of work. So the FDA in the US who um, are responsible for saying that these devices are fit for purpose and go out into the world, they've have a, they've sort of been running a project now for a number of years um, around doing the kind of safety modelling that that I was talking about. So there are a lot of people doing that work. It certainly wasn't just the two of us. And then we said, oh, we're going to do something else now. Um, so, you know, it is a really important thing because it's ongoing because there are always new medical devices and new modes of interaction. And again, you know, you just as sort of one of those those weird side effects, you, there was a, a time um, where in various medical settings, you would walk in and there would be instructions saying, please don't charge your phone in this socket. Do not unplug this thing and charge your phone. Or please don't, you know, plug your phone into this USB socket. Because people just go, oh, yeah, that looks like a PowerPoint. I'll plug it in. So there's kind of huge complexities, not just of the devices, but the, the context that they're in. Um, I didn't really even get on to talking about context. That's such an important part of any design. It's not just can the person use the device. It's can the person use the device when they're doing this job in this environment when these things are happening. It was really crucial in forestry um, because... It's an in-the-wild study, and we couldn't be there with them. Um, so one of our collaborators who'd done some work early on said, you know, if you go in and try and watch what the forestry workers are doing, what they're doing is watching you, making sure you don't get killed by a tree. And nobody does their normal kind of work pattern. So you'd leave these things in the wild, and then you'd see really weird data and go, wait a minute, this guy had no heart rate for 10 minutes at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. The, oh, well, maybe the technology stopped working. Wait a minute, the same guy had no heart rate for 10 minutes on Wednesday at 3 o'clock. And the same thing on Thursday. What was he doing? Well, he probably wanted to go off and have a smoko and thought that the technology would tell on him. So he'll just take it off and go and have a quick cigarette and then come back. Of course, if he'd kept it on, we'd have been none the wiser. But, you know, there's all of these contexts that are, that are really important. Um, so that work and the modelling of those devices and all of the... Number entry is a huge thing on those devices because they're all different. Um, so there's lots of people doing that. So so worry about them, but not to the point where you can't sleep. Okay, yes. So the question about teams um, about Bill Sage, um, you look back a lot of us. Yes. And then, anyway, and a lot of those things we have to operate on the assumption of past this thing. Basically, yes. What's the top? How do we read in about a situation where here? Yeah, so, really, well, the way in the media sometimes then sustain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have to blame that up. We, we don't even need to ask what happens. We've seen it, right? We've seen it recently with the storms and people not being able to get money out of a bank or pay anything with FPOS because there's no power and there's no internet. And the same thing with our forestry workers. They're in remote areas where there's no internet connectivity at the moment. And even presuming there will be, you know, in the near future, there'll be internet everywhere. Things break and they go down. And again, you're kind of locked in your house because there's a power outage or, you know, nothing works because there's no power. So now everybody has to have their own personal generator and their backup system. Um, slightly at a tangent to that, some, some other work that I'm doing with some, uh, some colleagues down at, at Vic is looking at kind of the implications of when we digitize these kind of everyday things like finance. When you when all your banking suddenly is turned into apps and mobile devices, what does that mean for people who don't have a mobile phone? They may have one that the entire family shares. So whose banking details can you see on that? Whose banking app is on there? Or I don't have a laptop, or I don't have internet connectivity. How do I transact in this world? So those are really important questions because it's not just well, we'll have some fail-safe within the system so that it will kind of fail gracefully. But, you know, if the power goes out and the internet goes out, all bets are off and we're kind of back to lighting a candle and warming up some water over a, a camping stove. So, You can have the last question. So you strung to ground with problem methods. Yes, and, you know, Curance and uh, yes, the whole thing that you ended up somehow at least your first relation with the ethics of technology. Yeah, 
great. Well, I think saying I've gone round in, in a circle is, is kind of very true because this notion of building models is still something I can't quite let go of. So this, you know, this idea of the digital twin of the human and the person and actually understanding of understanding what what is happening and what the impacts of these things are via simulations and models still very appealing to me. So um, beyond that, I don't know. I think, I, th I mean, I think ethics, I wouldn't have called it ethics, but the the sort of that, that human centeredness of everything to do with technology has always been there. It just kind of expresses itself perhaps in different ways now. And I think about it more from an ethical perspective. Um, I don't know. I'd love to be able to say I'm going to do a model-driven ethics thing about something. You know, that would be great. But modeling humans is really hard, it turns out. Human behavior is quite unpredictable. You know, it's that thing you always tell students. Go, well, you can design the system and you can do the nicest user interface and inputs and outputs. And if a person walks in and they just bang their elbows on the keyboard, what's going to happen? You just have to make assumptions at some point that people are going to try and do the right thing. At least you have to kind of offer them the right thing to do.